the Associates Board is very excited to have you all here as guests. Uh, the Associates Board, uh, of which I'm a member, um, is in its inaugural year. This is closing out our first year. And as James uh, related, uh, it's our mission to try to drive a conversation about faith and culture uh, for uh, our generation, but anyone who's interested in, in having that conversation. Uh, this talk is, is meant to be part of that vision. It's a fruit of that vision. Uh, we hope tonight to offer a setting for people to engage with uh, big questions that maybe ordinarily uh, it's hard to find the time to ask yourselves. Uh, what is the church? Who's God? Uh, why should I care? And we hope to do this in a stimulating and thought-provoking way. Uh, we are so committed to this conversation that afterwards we invite everyone to join us at Sean's on 48th Street. It has a big Guinness right outside. So all you have to do is walk right around the corner and we'd love to uh, continue the conversation over drinks after the talk. Uh, I need to say a few thanks. Uh, thanks to America Media, to the Editor-in-Chief Matt Malone, to the Board Chair Susan Braddock and the Board of Directors, um, America staff who has worked uh, tirelessly to uh, see this event come to fruition. Uh, we. I want to thank uh, the other board members that I'm uh, lucky enough to serve with. It's been a pleasure to serve with you, and uh, I'm excited for this event to um, uh, for this event to go quite well. Um, most of all, I have to I have to thank uh, my good friend Father Michael Himes for coming down from Boston uh, and spending the night with us this evening. Coming back to his hometown, uh, Father Michael Himes is a native of Brooklyn. And although Boston has become his adopted second home, uh, we want to give him a big New York welcome. It's been such a warm New York welcome that two of Father Himes' high school teachers are here in the front row. And so we're particularly excited to have them here. Um, Father Himes' reputation precedes him. Uh, in many ways, it's difficult to make an introduction for Father Michael Himes. For the last 25 years, he's taught at Boston College in the theology department. He's a uh, beloved uh, feature on campus, in and out of the classroom. Before that, he taught at the University of Notre Dame. And before that, he was the dean of the Huntington Seminary on Long Island. Uh, at those institutions, he's won uh, numerous teaching awards, which speak to the indelible effect he's had on literally thousands of students. Uh, one one award that I think speaks volumes is that in the, in the only six years that he was at Notre Dame, in back-to-back -back years, he was voted the uh, most influential teacher on the entire campus, two years running. At Boston College, where I had the good fortune of meeting Father Himes, uh, he, for many, is the bookend of their Boston College experience. You meet him first at his uh, talk at orientation uh, for every single freshman, and uh, many of us had the luck to have him uh, send us out into the real world, quote-unquote, with his senior toast. Uh, Father Himes will undoubtedly never know the range of the influence he's had on uh, all of his former students and, and just people like yourselves. Uh, I learned this firsthand in promoting this very talk. I uh, had an actual paper flyer for this talk, uh, and I approached a person I know uh, and went to go tell him about the talk. He looked at the picture once and was kind of frozen uh, and said, I know, I know this man. I said, oh, really? Okay. And he said, uh, I was in the pews in a parish on Long Island in the 1980s when Father Himes was preaching. It was during that mass, during his preaching, that I decided to become a priest myself. So watch out. You, you, <laughs> might, you might just feel yourself so inspired in ways you never even uh, thought. Uh, that man is now a uh, pastor himself. He's been a priest for 25 years, uh, and he's a pastor here at a thriving parish in Manhattan. Um, finally, uh, I would just invite everyone to, uh, tonight, if pretend uh, you're in Theology 101 with your favorite professor, uh, try to put aside uh, work and the busy day that you'll surely have tomorrow. Part of the idea of this event was to give everyone a taste of what, it, what it's like to sit in Father Himes' classroom. So without further ado, uh, I introduce to you uh, my dear friend and unforgettable teacher, Father Michael Himes. Well, thank you, Christian, for that wonderfully warm welcome. 
Uh, sounds like such an interesting person. I'd love to meet this time someday. Uh, I might mention that when I met Christian, I had the privilege of being the director of his undergraduate thesis, which was an absolutely wonderful thesis on Erasmus of Rotterdam. So if this gets too boring, what I'm going to be talking about, we can stop at any point and talk about Erasmus instead, if you'd prefer. Uh, what I'm going to talk about with you this evening is something that has become a constantly repeated refrain, I find, especially among college age or just immediately post-college young men and women. It is the statement that, well, I'm not really very, I, I, I think of myself as a very spiritual person. I pray and I, I try, try to foster a relationship with God, but in fact, I don't belong to any particular church or any organized religion. I think of myself as deeply spiritual, but not really religious. Now, I can understand why that's an attractive thing to some people to say. The closer you get to the institution sometimes, the more you feel that uh, you could be more genuinely holy and spiritual by having nothing to do with it. <laughs> but I'm going to suggest to you two reasons why it is impossible to genuinely be holy and not part of the church, not part of the community of faith in some way. And so the first way I'm going to suggest that we need to do this is I'm going to ask you to consider with me for a moment what is undoubtedly the least often preached on verses in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2 of Luke's Gospel, you will remember, are the account of the Annunciation, Jesus' birth, the uh, finding of the child in the temple, um, and then we jump to his adulthood and the start of Jesus' preaching ministry. And we read the first two verses of Genesis, of, uh, of um, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of, of um, Laconia, and uh, Lysanias, governor of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to a man named John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert beyond the Jordan. Now, I suspect you haven't used those verses for personal meditation much <laughs> lately, and they don't seem to be the most inspiring verses, but they're immensely important because of what they're not. They are not once upon a time. You see, this is not a story about a timeless event. It's not a story about something that ha could happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. It claims to be a story that happened to a particular person in a particular place at a particular time. Christianity is not based on a doctrine or a timeless image or a, an often repeated liturgical action. All of that may have something to do with Christian life, but it's not what the basis of Christianity is. Christianity is based first and foremost on an event, an event that happened at a particular time in a particular place involving particular people. How do you communicate an event? How do you share an event? You see, an idea can be, different people can arrive at the same idea starting from different perspectives, taking different lengths of time, arguing in different ways, and come to the same conclusion. But how do you pass on an event? The only way you can do it is to hand it on as news. For example, um, we talk about the gospel, which remember is simply Godus Spella, it's God's speech, God's announcement, God's proclamation. Well, a proclamation requires somebody who does the proclaiming and somebody to whom the proclaiming is done. That if you were going to say that Christianity is about a particular event which gets told to us, which was communicated to us, then without that person who does the communicating, there'd be no Christianity. Christianity is not something that we can arrive at as a, an idea that we develop because of our own insight or our own devotion or our own passionate study 
all of that's wonderful, but that's not what makes us Christian. What makes us Christian is an announcement, the announcement of the gospel. And therefore, since the uh, Christianity is based on a proclamation, we need people, we need a community of persons who are going to proclaim that gospel, who are going to announce the, t the truth, who are going to lead us to accept the event because it happened to them. That's why it is so important that we recognize that we are part of a community. It's part of a community because the church is never simply a deduction. It's never simply a fascinating idea. It's never simply a pious wish. It's never simply a great hope. It's an event. And that event can only be brought to us by somebody who comes and tells us about it. It has to be proclaimed. So the first thing to realize is the reason we need a church is because the gospel requires communicators. It requires a community of people who pass on the good news. You may believe them or not believe them. You may agree with them or disagree with them, but you can't get around them. You can't have an, an, a non-apostolic church, a church that isn't rooted in the primary experience of the people who first made this proclamation and then pro proclaim it ourselves to others. But if that's true, then what does that say about the presence of the Holy Spirit? Well, let me point out something about the presence of the Spirit, a few general characteristics of the coming of the Spirit, so that if you bump into the Spirit, you'll recognize him. <laughs> the first thing that I would want to notice is that the Spirit of God is a Spirit that brings us together. There was, especially at the start of the uh, third century, so the early 200s, there was a movement among many communities of Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire that held that in order that the church was holy because the people who made it up were holy. And if somebody was not holy, if you were, heaven forbid, a sinner, if you were somebody who had denied the faith, somebody who had cracked in the face of persecution, then you couldn't belong to the church. We have to fling you out because the church is holy because it's made up of holy people. And so if you are not holy, you can't be a member. St. Augustine hated that. He hated it because he realized it's the start of Puritanism. He, of course, didn't know the word Puritanism. But the Puritan era is to think that it is, it is we who make the church holy. Augustine maintained it's not, it's not our goodness, our fidelity, our prayerfulness, our charity that makes the church holy. It's the Spirit of God. And how do you know that the Spirit of God is at work? You know the Spirit of God is at work because the Spirit always draws us into union with one another. So, for example, if you think of the familiar story of the coming of the Spirit, at the start of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We know that Jesus is, is described, I'm sorry, the Spirit is described as coming and bringing people to have the ability to hear one another speak in their common tongue. It says that, whoops. Thank you. Thank heaven that wasn't opened. Um, it is, a, it is a way of realizing that the, uh, the, what makes the church holy is not that we do holy things or lead holy lives. It's that the Spirit of God, who is the source of all holiness, is poured out into our lives. And the sign of that is that we are brought together. If you think, for example, of the familiar story of the coming of the Spirit as told in Acts, that the disciples are gathered in an upper room, the door is locked because they're afraid that the people who had arrested and executed Jesus will now turn their attention to them. Jesus has ascended into heaven. They feel alone. They feel they've been, in some extent, in some, in some ways, abandoned. I think we're going to let you be the, uh, 
Danke Dean for this occasion. <laughs> um, the Spirit of God breaks down the, the burden of division. The Spirit of God makes it possible for us to talk to one another without language posing any barriers. The Spirit of God breaks through division and brings about unity. That's true in that account of the coming of the Spirit, but there's also another account of the coming of the Spirit. There's the account in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, Jesus, the night of the resurrection, they've discovered that the tomb is empty that morning. That night they're gathered in the upper room. Jesus appears to them and says, Peace be with you. Whose sins you forgive, I forgive. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And then he tells them, I leave you one new dis uh, uh, commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. If you love one another, the Father and I will come and make our dwelling with you. Well, think about that for a moment. What is the sign of the coming of the Spirit? It is that now we can forgive one another. If there were grievances, angers, uh, scandals that separated us before, we can forgive that now. The Spirit has moved us to the point where we can forgive. And because of that, we know the Spirit is at work in us. Because the first fruit of the Spirit is that we love one another. And then the Father and the Lord come and dwell with us. So that the mark of the coming of the Spirit is always unity. But unity in what way? What are we talking about when we talk about this unity? Well, let me uh, ask you to think of a familiar story in the Gospels. And I'm going to trace it from Mark to Matthew to Luke and then finally to, uh, to John. I'm sorry, I'm going to, Mark will be the next to last. It will go Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. Is it familiar? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, oh, I have the spike on, too. Um, if you remember the, um, the story in Matthew's Gospel of the scribe who comes up to Jesus in order to trip him up, the text says that this is designed to embarrass Jesus. And the question that the scribe asks is, what is the greatest commandment? Now, we have to realize that was a much debated question in Jesus' lifetime in rabbinic circles. That when the rabbis came together and discussed how to read the law, how to live the Mosaic law, one of the questions that would invariably come up is, what is the most important commandment? What is the commandment that lays the foundation for all the others? And some rabbis held that it was, love God with your whole mind, heart, and your whole being. Others said, no, that's a great commandment, but it's not really, it's not really a demand. It doesn't place it, it doesn't, it's not given to us as if it were a command. If you want to talk about the greatest commandment, it's love your neighbor as yourself. So the scribe is expecting that since the great rabbis have never been able to resolve this question, Certainly this carpenter's son from a hick town up in Galilee isn't going to be able to answer it. And everybody will see that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, has no real education as a rabbi, will dismiss him and go their way. So he's expecting that he's got Jesus trapped. And Jesus simply says to him, the first commandment is love God with your whole mind, heart, and soul. And the second is exactly like it, love your neighbor as yourself, period, end of story. Now, it's a fascinating story in itself, but it gets even more interesting when you move to, uh, to Luke's Gospel. Because at Luke's Gospel, a scribe comes up again to ask Jesus this trick question. And this time, Jesus doesn't answer him. Jesus simply turns the table around and says, well, you're a scribe. What do you read? And the scribe says, well, some say, love God with your whole mind, heart, and soul. And others say, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, fine, do that, and you'll be great. <laughs> well, that's not the scribe. You're going to let him off the hook that easily. So the scribe says to him, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus launches into one of the two most famous parables that are only found in Luke's gospel, namely the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
And you remember that in the Samaritan story, a, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Literally, you do go down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem's in the hills, Jericho's in the valley. So you go down if you're traveling to Jericho. And he was set upon by robbers who beat him up and stole his goods and left him bleeding by the side of the road. Up the road, so not down to a Jericho, but up to a Jerusalem, a priest was going by. And the priest saw the man bleeding by the side of the road and crossed over to the other side and went on his way. And a Levite, which by this point in Jewish history would have been a sort of a sacristan, somebody who took care of the physical responsibilities needed to keep the temple running. Uh, a, 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 um, a Levite was going by and he saw the man bleeding by the side of the road and crossed over to the other side. And then along the road, see we don't know where he's going, it's either up nor down, it's just along the road, there came a, uh, a Samaritan, a Samaritan who doesn't go to worship in the temple, a Samaritan who is a half-breed Jew, a Samaritan who is not to be trusted, not to be dealt with by a good, responsible Jewish person at the time of Jesus. Well, the, scribe, the, um, the Samaritan sees, Jesus, sees the man bleeding at the side of the road and immediately goes to assist him takes him to an inn, pays for his care, tells the innkeeper that if, if anything more is spent on him, let me know and I'll reimburse you on my way back again. Jesus then says to the scribe, who do you think was the neighbor to the man who was bleeding, who was beaten up by the robbers? And the, and the scribe says, by the way, it's very interesting, so the gospel is filled with these wonderful little touches. If you remember, the scribe says, well, the one who helped him. He doesn't say the Samaritan. He can't bring himself to say the word. I mean, Samaritans are so awful that you can't even talk about them. So why in, uh, I tell my students this all the time, um, I, my field is not New Testament. There are a host of people who've been trying to figure out what my field is for 30 years now. Um, <laughs> but it's historical theology, but it's, um, what I want to point out is that there are all sorts of issues that the parables raise because the parables are not short stories. They're not about telling us, they're not like the short stories of Hawthorne or Melville or, or William Faulkner or Eudora Wealthy. They just, they don't tell us plots with all sorts of interesting character development and, and uh, connections made between stories the, that centered on one issue and to make that one issue clear and important and plain and having a, a real effect in our lives, the, uh, they leave out everything else, all sorts of things we would like to know. Think, for example, again of the Good Samaritan for a moment. Wouldn't you like to know what happened? Did the Samaritan ever... When he came back, did the man thank him? Did, um, uh, did uh, it change his opinion about Samaritans? Uh, we don't know. It's like uh, the uh, prodigal son. Uh, we've got, uh, I mean, it's a very sexist story, you notice. We've got a father and two sons. There's no mother and there's no, there are no sisters. There are no wives in the story. It's a purely masculine world that the good Samaritan, that the prodigal son inhabits, which may be why he makes such a mess of it. Um, <laughs> but the key thing that I want to point out is when, why is it that the, the priest and the Levite not only ignore the man bleeding by the side of the road, but pass over to the other side? The reason is because why would a priest and a Levite likely be going up to Jerusalem to perform their functions in the temple? But blood makes you unkosher, it makes you unclean. So you can't go into the temple and perform the sacrificial functions. So that they step over to the other side because they've got to make sure none of that blood splashes on them. The reason that they can't stop and help the man who has been set upon by robbers is because they've got to get to the temple to pray. 
And so Jesus is saying to them, in effect, don't you realize that if you think that ignoring your neighbor is a way to give glory to God, you don't have a clue who your God is. You don't understand what God means. Everybody is your neighbor. That's clearly what it's saying. But it's also saying something else. It's saying that it is only by being in communion with one another that we find out who God is. So now we go on to the third story. It's the same story, but told now in a very different way in Mark's Gospel. Mark's got, I, uh, just a, a, a personal comment. I, think, I guess everybody goes through in the course of their lives um, times when one gospel becomes their favorite or another gospel, the one you turn to all the time for, uh, for um, religious, uh, for uh, spiritual reading and for material for uh, meditation. Well, over the last, I'd say, eight to ten years, Mark has become my favorite. It used to be John, it was Luke for a long time, but Mark is now, I think, simply extraordinary. And Mark gives us this same story, but with very significant differences. If you look at the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you'll find that conversation between Jesus and the scribe, who's asking him questions, trying to trip him up. You'll find that conversation right in the middle of the Gospels. If you look for that same story in Mark's Gospel, you'll find it's the very end, the last thing we hear about Jesus' public preaching. And that will get emphasized by the last line of the story. A scribe comes up to ask Jesus a question. And the question is, Rabbi, and please notice he gives him the title. The title that the, that, uh, the scribe in Matthew and in, uh, in Luke it's denied Jesus, the scribe is perfectly willing to give him. Rabbi, what is the first commandment? And Jesus responds by saying, love God with your whole mind, heart, and being. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe then says, well done, Rabbi. Nothing is more important than loving God totally. And there is no sacrifice that can be offered in, a te in the temple greater than loving our neighbor. He apparently had been reading Luke's gospel. You see. <laughs> what is, and then we read, Jesus said to him, you are very close to the kingdom of God. And the last line of the passage is, no one else ever dared to ask him a question. This is the story that silences everyone. There's nothing left to talk about. There's nothing left to say. If you get this, you've got it all. If you've got everything else and you miss this, you've got nothing. It all hinges on the recognition that the first and the second commandment are identical. That you, to love God is to love your neighbor, and to love your neighbor is to love God. Nowhere is this said more insistently than in John. I think Mark says it in some ways more intriguingly, but John says it with great power and great beauty. He will insist, I have washed your feet, and in doing so have done what only a slave would be required to do. But you, you are called to wash one another's feet. If Anyone who wishes to, to be my follower has to love his or her neighbors. It's very fascinating, at least it is fascinating to me, that in this gospel passage, in the familiar story, the, the great, um, the great um, Last Supper speech of Jesus that takes up the whole of chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, the other three synoptics do the whole of the, of the uh, Last Supper in about 10 verses. John takes the whole of 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 to say what he wants about the Last Supper. And what has he got to say about it? It's Jesus saying to his followers, it's Jesus' meditation on community and agapic love, genuine self-gift for the good of the other. <laughs> 
And what does he have to say about this genuine self-gift? What does he have to say about this, uh, this way of relating to God as, as being uh, grounded in loving our neighbor? What he has to say about it is that this is the, this is the key that unlocks everything else. It's very interesting throughout the whole of that long passage on the Last Supper in John 13 through 17 that Jesus will tell us over and over again, he tells us, as a matter of fact, the Father loves me, I love the Father. The Father loves you, you love, you love uh, the Father. I love you. But he never says to them, you ought to love me. Because God is not the object of love first and foremost. God in the Johannine vision is the foundation of love. It's not that we all go out and work very hard and so come to be loving. It's that if we are genuinely responding with patience and kindness and forgiveness and courage and energy and love and wisdom for one another, that we of course will bump into God. It's the reason that Jesus can say that only those people who have genuinely loved one another ever get to know God. You can't know what God is, you can't know what the meaning of the word God is unless you have lived agapically. It's the reason why Jesus can say in the strongest terms possible, and it gets repeated then in the first letter of John, Anyone who says he loves God but does not love his brother and sister is a liar. Actually, what the Greek text says, it, it, carries, it can be translated as is a liar, but there's an even better, I think, translation of it. And it is, it's talking nonsense. Anybody who says that they can love God and not love their neighbor is babbling. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know who their neighbor is and they don't know who God is. It is only by washing one another's feet that you come to recognize who God is. God is not the object of our love. God is the source of our love, the foundation of our love. And that's what Augustine insisted on in response to those people who back at the second in the third century would have maintained that it is by our personal holiness that we transform the church that the community is holy because all of us who make it up are, ho are holy. I've often thought that Puritans must never have met other Christians because it doesn't sound like any of the Christians I know. That in fact, it's not about our doing good. It's about God's work in us. It's about our being led to love others. And therefore, what must you do if you are going to be if, if, you are, if you genuinely want to be holy, if you genuinely want to welcome the Spirit of God into your life, if you genuinely want to embrace holiness, you have to do it by loving your neighbor. If there is no community of people whom you love, if you, are, if you live in a sort of isolation from others, if you live apart from others, if you refuse to, to give yourself to others, then you will inevitably miss what God is. You'll be babbling. Or perhaps in that even harsher phrase of John's, you'll be lying. God is the, is the ground of all of our capacity for love. And if we want to learn who God is, if we want to experience God, we have to do it by loving one another which means you can't do it out of community. That only in communion with one another do we ever really know who God is. That if you want to know who God is, don't go off to the desert. A dear friend of mine and a very distinguished theologian indeed uh, in England, Nicholas Lash. Uh, Nicholas, I remember him saying once in a conversation, and I thought it was such a perceptive comment, he said, you know, you have to be very careful about the desert experience. People talk about the desert experience going off to be alone, to be, one with, to be alone with God, to be able to concentrate and center one's attention on God. Nicholas said, that could be very good, 
but that you should notice in scripture that there are two possibilities. Some people go out to the desert and encounter God. Some people go out to the desert and meet the devil. And it's very hard to tell which one you've met. It's not, it's, to go off by oneself is not the, a wise way to discover who God is. We only discover who God is by being in communion with one another, by being in love with one another. What would that mean in terms of the church? Well, it means that there are two reasons why you can't say, I think of myself as very religious and spiritual, but I don't belong to any community. You have to belong to a community. You have to be able to recognize that it is in loving others, in forming communion with others, in being forgiven by others and in accepting that forgiveness and in extending that forgiveness back to them. It is the only way in which we ever become holy. That holiness is not something that we achieve, it's something given to us by God and the sign of it is that we want to come together. That, it, that we are led to come together and therefore are able to, to recognize the reality and presence of God. It also is true that the only way in which we can know about those first events, that we can know what happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, etc., 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 that it, the only way we can know that is because there are people who tell us that. And unless we are given that gift by others, we never get it. The only way we can get it is that somebody else gives it to us. It's... Uh, I wrote uh, my, uh, a book a number of years ago about a great 19th century German theologian named Johann Adam Möller. And Möller uh, says a number of really fascinating things. Now, he says them in 18th century German, and so uh, you have a lot to forgive him for. But uh, he, he says at one point, and I think a very perceptive comment, he says, it's very interesting to notice that nobody can give himself a sacrament. If you're going to be baptized, somebody else has to pour the water and say the formula. Same thing with confirmation. If you're, going to, if you're getting married, or if you're getting married, uh, it's very wise to have somebody else there. Uh, <laughs> it would be really boring without it, I think. Um, it, 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 the, when, the, when we... we um, go to confession. We can't give ourselves absolution. That in fact, all the sacraments are gifts that we give to one another. You can't receive them alone. It's somebody else who has to give it to you. That's because that's the very structure of life. The very structure of life is that the foundation of everything that exists brings us into existence by giving himself away to us. If that's so, then I think there's real reason to be concerned about this claim that I, I think of myself as deeply religious, but I'm not part of any recognizable community. If you don't become a member of a community because you think that they are, this community is um, too narrow, mistaken in its approach, uh, false in its teaching, uh, idolatrous in its style of worship, if you have all sorts of criticisms of the community and use that not to enter a community, then you don't know who God is. We need to be people who can bring ourselves to embrace and to let ourselves be embraced by a, a community of people who aren't saints. You see, it would not require immense brilliance or energy or insight to fall in love with somebody who's genuinely lovable. But to love somebody who is a pain in the neck to love somebody who seems never to get it, who, who is just too dull to understand what's going on. 
So love somebody who is too blind to be able to recognize the presence of God in what they're experiencing. To love somebody who never says thank you, that requires miraculous grace. That requires, that's grace. It's not a question of loving another and being, because they're lovable. Love the other because the other is the other, not because the other is lovable. As a matter of fact, it's um, probably the people who learn to love best are the people who are confronted by others who know exactly where the chinks in their armor are so that you can put the dagger in for maximum damage. It's a question of loving those who don't love us. Loving those who haven't the wisdom to see the importance of love. Loving others who don't have the experience of love. And it requires us to extend that love to people who could say with some truth that it, they have it very difficult in trying to recognize the presence of God because they've never received agape love. Think of the number of people who um, find themselves abandoned, who find themselves uh, dismissed from others' lives, who seem to have no great importance. Think of children who are held at borders without their parents. Think of people who are who do not experience agape love. How are they ever going to know what love means? The great danger is that we proclaim God is love, but we proclaim it in such a way that nobody in the, in the congregation knows what we're talking about because they don't experience love. We have to provide the experience to the extent that we can. We have to be people who love others agapically so that perhaps others will then glimpse the activity, the presence, the vitality of God. We are not people who belong to a timeless community of well-intentioned, kindly, generous folk who live in a little bubble off on their own. We are people who are plunged into a world where agape love is possible but it is improbable. It's not likely, but it can happen, and it does happen. And the fact that you and I are here is a sign of that, of that holiness, a sign of that communion. So I'm suggesting to you that what we must do is in the gentlest, most loving, most... Um, patient way possible, but still with the greatest clarity and the greatest insistence that we can, that we say to our brothers and sisters who tell us that they are very spiritual but not really terribly connected to any community of, of, uh, of grace, that we say to them, you're wrong and you have more to experience. And it's in the way in which you live your life with all the others that you will come to see the, the reality of God transforming our lives and transforming the lives of the world around us. It's like the last line of Georges Bernanos's great novel, Diary of a Country Priest. If you've read that novel, you will remember it, I'm sure. If you haven't read it, do. The, the priest in question is dying of tuberculosis. He's being tended by the country doctor, 
in, a, in, in this town, which was the priest's parish, in which he seems to have been another failure. He hasn't changed anyone's life. Nothing is, nothing is different. He hasn't improved a lot of the people or built up a great and powerful and, and a strong and effective community. He's dying, it would appear a failure, and the doctor who tends him is in fact an atheist. He doesn't even believe the things, anything that this priest stands for. And the doctor narrates the end of the book to us. We, we're reading a letter that the doctor has written to some other people recounting the death of this priest. And he says, I must confess, I don't know what he was saying at, his, at the end. I caught only one sentence with complete clarity. And that is that as he died, he said, Tutte grace, it's all grace. That's the thing that we must proclaim. It's all grace. It's all given to us. It's not produced by us. Augustine was right, and the Puritans of his time and of every time are wrong. It's not about our making the church holy or making the world holy. It's about our recognizing that it is holy and that we have to celebrate it. That celebration is perhaps the single most important thing we can do to make our contemporaries, to lead our contemporaries, to see what we mean when we talk about God, to see what the tradition means when it talks about God, to see what people have been handing on from generation to generation ever since the first generation, ever since the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. And what, it's, what our response in attempting to see the world that way and to give it to others, what we, ex what we have to do is let ourselves be seen as joyful. I'm inclined to think, as I edge ever so gingerly through late middle age, <laughs> that uh, I, I think that Augustine was exactly right, that the great sign of the work of God is joy. And the great sign to our contemporaries who don't see the need to belong to such a community is not to say, come and we'll purify it together. Come and we'll purge the church together. Come and we'll restart the church and move it in a new and better direction. The real response is to be able to say, yes, the church has done some terrible things. The church has done some weak things. The church has done some foolish things. The church has missed the point at various times in its history and at other times deliberately ignored the point. But the church is filled with joy because it knows that everything is grace and that we are the people to whom the proclamation has been made and who are invited now to live out that proclamation in a spirit of profound joy. I'm inclined to think, well, I will, I will tell you a story to conclude. Uh, my mother came to live with me when I moved from Boston College to uh, Notre Dame, from Notre Dame to Boston College. And uh, we had some very happy years together. And uh, then mother dementia took hold. And eventually it got to the point where I, it, was, I, she, it was dangerous for her to be home. And so 
she went into a nursing home and I, for seven years, visited her every night because she could only go to sleep if I was holding her hand. She could only, uh, she'd only eat if I fed her. And um, a few months before she passed away, there was one evening when I arrived at the nursing home and she was having a particularly bad day. She, was, she really didn't know anybody and she was not in, in good condition, good shape at all. And I said to her, darling, do you know who I am? Do you recognize me? And she stopped and scrutinized my face. And then she said, I don't know who you are, but I think you are someone I loved very much. Well, I called my brother Kenneth, who's also a professor at Boston College and a Franciscan priest. I called my brother Kenneth and I said, I don't know when God is going to take Mother home to himself but I am absolutely sure that she is the best theologian in the family. <laughs> uh, because she got it right. It's not how much you have been loved, it's how much you love that matters. That you may forget everything else, you may even forget having been loved but you never forget loving. If once you've loved another human being, that's there forever. I may not, I'm afraid I cannot remember your name, but I know that you're someone I loved very much. You can't get that on your own. You've got to get it in communion with others. And then you recognize it's all grace. Thank you.